Now, from WPRI 12, a special presentation honoring black history, mind, body, soul. Good evening. Welcome to our Honoring Black History, Mind, Body, Soul. I'm Mike Montecalvo. And I'm Chelsea Jones. Over the next half hour, we'll examine the impact of black history on our country and right here in southern New England, starting with the Ocean State's vital role in the Underground Railroad. And we're hearing it from someone with a direct link to its history. Take a listen. Havana, January 24th, 1819. My dear, loving, and affectionate wife, I embrace this opportunity to write you again, my dear girl, for fear that you would not receive the first letter I wrote you. Words written on worn paper stained with time lying on the table that sits inside of Kimberly Dumpson's ancestor's house. The time is very tedious for me to be absent from you for so long. But my dear girl, I shall not ever cross the Atlantic Ocean again to leave you behind. This home belonged to her grandfather's great-grandfather, Isaac Rice Sr., an abolitionist and friend to Frederick Douglass. Tell Mr. Rice I have been amusing my boys with his riddle. None of them guessed it. Thank you for your kindness, your friend, Frederick Douglass. This home on the corner of William and Thomas streets was a place to rest, recharge and refuel and a station on the Underground Railroad in Newport. This has been preserved over many generations of, and uh, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Not to be confused with a physical train and tracks, the Underground Railroad was a network of people, places, and routes helping black people escape slavery in the South. Bethel AME Church Providence, uh, there was a tunnel underneath the original church. This was another stop along the way. Bethel AME Church in Providence, originally located at 193 Meeting Street, which is now home to Brown University. Bethel now sits in this brick building less than 10 minutes away. A place of rest was critically important and having the church there was also important as well because it also talks about our faith. It talks about us as a people. I paid my mistress $120 a year. A part of the time I had to find my board in all of my clothing. This was the direct and unequivocal testimony that Michael gave of his slave life. You now see an active involvement of free black congregations in New England and the North generally organizing themselves to provide a network of opportunities for escaped slaves. Pews and the pulpit were pivotal for free blacks, a place for them to have a sense of community. Many of the leading locations for Underground Railroad activities in Rhode Island are very much tied to some of the earliest free black churches, um, Bethel AME Church, Cognon Street Church, Union Colored Congregational Church in Newport. All of those churches were part of that network of early free black churches who were organized, had communication capabilities, and most importantly, had the ability to, to accept these enslaved Africans. In Dumson's case, these walls tell the tale of the sweetness and the struggle that were reality for black people during the 19th century. Michael left a wife and one child in slavery, but they were not owned by his mistress. Before escaping, he felt afraid to lead his companion into the secret of his contemplated movements. But not only black people are to credit for the progression of enslaved people, Quakers played a role in abolition too. Sometimes we have a tendency of thinking that, you know, it was only black folk. Uh, it, allyship is very rich in history as well. These are folks that were really pushing to make sure that this country stood up to and, and embodied the meaning of what was in those founding documents. But what is fact and what is fiction as far as the Underground Railroad is concerned? They weren't living, uh, hiding in trap doors or, or, in, or in locations uh, to be hidden away. They were hiding in plain sight. The beauty in what Africans who came to America brought with them is their culture, customs, and skills. And we see that in New England today. That network is still alive. It may not be underground, but it is still alive and it's still alive and well. So beyond the struggle, for Dumpson, it's the rich history of her own ancestors that she holds in her hands, but also in her heart, that she uses as fuel to accomplish what people said she couldn't. It's a huge responsibility to be able to tell somebody else's story. 
um, it is our story, but it's also the human story, and uh, it's beautiful. I love telling that story. There are several other prominent locations of the Underground Railroad all across New England, from Newport to New Bedford and even Bridgewater, Connecticut, bustling black communities that have established new life for those seeking refuge from slavery. Work for it more than you hope for it. It's just one of the mottos for an inner city barbershop that's providing more than just a trim. Haircuts and Heritage is a unique opportunity to help inner city kids of color get a free haircut while learning a little history in hopes of making this a better world. We keep the top up here, you want me to cut it down all low? How you want it? Pairing young people with trusted adults. After your haircut, you can go pick a book out over there, all right? Giving them a chance to talk about their goals and dreams. What are you into? What are you gonna study? Uh, civil engineering in IT. Yes, sir. All while getting a free haircut. I let them know who I am. I say my full name. I shake their hand firmly. I let them know that welcome to Haircuts and Heritage. Aiden, pleasure to meet you. It's your first time here? Yeah. And then I talk about, you know, their haircut, but I also talk about their heritage. When you come here, it's the same spot. And who I am and where I came from, a naval barber. Middle school right now is different, man. I've been to war. I have three children. These are the things that I want them to leave with. This is not just a hangout. So it tells all about how little boy, how you, you know, you wear your crown right. How you want to be a king one day, right? Kobe Dennis is the owner of Haircuts and Heritage in Pawtucket. Good, you look good when you came in here, but you look better now. He tells me haircutting in the urban setting has always been a place for young people of color to go and talk about what's on their minds. It was like a bunch of people jumping in and fighting. We thought this would be the perfect backdrop to allow young people, especially during times like, you know, these COVID times, to be able to come and just talk and let their feelings out in a safe space. Students are referred to the shop from middle and high schools in Pawtucket, Providence, and Central Falls, and must maintain good grades in order to get a free haircut. But it's more than a cut. What was that experience like? Mentors from all walks of life. Which football team you like? Listening. So that's an awesome program. And giving advice. Dennis says it's a teachable moment, not just during Black History Month, but every month. Uh, this all means something. You know, this is not some type of vain type of event where myself and other leaders from the past are, are featured on the shop. We do that to, to remind them of who they really are. You'll see no depictions of slaves. You'll see no depictions of anyone in jail. You'll see no depictions of no negativity. We want there to be positive images from the time they walk in to the time they're in the shop. Appreciate you. Take care. You coming back again? All right, I hope so. To the time they leave. Dennis says it's not easy today for young people of color. Gun violence, poverty. It scares me when these young people tell us the stories that they tell us. You know, the barber chair is also, you know, a truth teller. A lot of things they wouldn't tell the police. A lot of things they wouldn't tell their teachers or their parents. They will tell their barber. Manager Jordan Bishop says the shop is also an art gallery and library. We have books that, that help them build their imagination and, and their mindset. Looking to change the world one haircut at a time. A lot of times they want to talk about what they want to do um, when they get out of high school, what they see in the news, things that's going on in social media, and um, the part they want to play um, in changing things. All haircuts have to be scheduled in advance online, including school referrals. You can find a link for that and how to do it on our website. An incredible story, an incredible program. So if someone wanted to help an at-risk student, how do they do that? They can do that, Chelsea. Absolutely. All you have to do is go to our website. We posted a link to Haircut in Heritage uh, Venmo and Cash App on our website. They tell great stories. Kobe does a great job with this organization. We need more programs yeah, like absolutely. that. Absolutely. All right. Coming, coming up. up. And it's an honor for me to know that there are young women, young men, people of color, uh, people of diverse backgrounds who are watching and saying, wow, she's there. That means that's something I can do. She's been the voice and the face of public health in Rhode Island throughout the pandemic. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott on her role over the past two years and why there's still work to be done. Plus, keeping the faith for over 200 years, we're taking a trip to Rhode Island's oldest black congregation.
She's a familiar face to many by now, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. The former director of the Rhode Island Department of Health played a pivotal role in the last two years. Our own Sheena Loshuto sat down with her to talk about her role and how she feels about being called an inspiration for many young women of color. She's been the voice and face of public health for Rhode Island during the pandemic. We've gotten to know Dr. Alexander Scott over the last two years. During her final days on the job, we sat down with her to talk about her role during the pandemic and why she says there's much more work to be done. Ensuring that people are wearing masks, expansive testing. We've been adapting, can be sewn adapting by hand or can be improvised. I'm proud of what Rhode Islanders have embraced and understood. Since being on the front lines of the battle against coronavirus, she's become a household name. Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, Hearing from parents who say their children want to be just like her when they grow up. While she's been called an inspiration for her dedication, she says it's the little things like that inspiring her. And it's an honor for me to know that there are young women, young men, people of color, uh, people of diverse backgrounds who are watching and saying, wow, she's there. That means that's something I can do. Every voice and every perspective is needed, it matters, and it will make a difference. A difference she's still hoping to make in her new role as a consultant for the health department. According to the state COVID-19 vaccine tracker, as of this month, about 41,000 eligible African-American Rhode Islanders are at least partially vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccine hesitancy is a topic heavily influenced by history in the black community. We asked Alexander Scott about that during a one-on-one -on -one interview last month. Yeah, I like to frame it in terms of building confidence in the vaccine and ensuring that there is access that's present. Alexander Scott says it's important to understand perspective and meet people where they're at and then addressing their concerns. She realizes there's a lot more to do. Communities of color have a number of additional elements that are key to why we need to have this conversation. It's when you look at the living conditions, the social, economic, and environmental factors that contribute to why those conditions are more prevalent in those communities, that has to be taken into account when we're talking about access to important tools like the COVID-19 vaccine. When you think of public health, Alexander Scott says it's realizing your actions impact others. One by one, all together, she believes we can make a better community. Every additional person that hears this and makes a better decision for themselves and for their family makes it worth it. And that's what she wants to focus on, making things more positive for everyone. And strong leaders make that happen. She often thinks of a phrase from a mentor in her life. Diversity brings strength. And having diverse perspectives, um, being able to get uh, different takes on what's needed, that strengthens us to have the most effective strategy. This Black History Month, she wants Rhode Islanders to know this. Well, it's just an opportunity to continue to recognize what so many people across uh, public health have uh, dedicated to making things better with a particular focus on achieving health equity as a part of it. You can count on the Rhode Island Department of Health uh, delivering even better and stronger going forward into the future. A future she believes in for all of us, asking everyone to do your part, not just for others, but for yourself. And any messages for any young girls watching when this airs? For sure. Set your goal of what you wanna achieve and uh, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Dr. Alexander Scott will continue in her role as a consultant until May. She was the first black woman ever to serve as director. I'm Sheena Loshuto, 12 News. Sheena, thank you. Coming up, worship with a side of history. We're going inside Rhode Island's oldest black congregation, learning its roots and how it's managed to deliver a message of hope and freedom for two centuries. And we're hitting the slopes as a group of students of color get the opportunity to ski for the very first time. Stay with us. Welcome back. A local church has played a pivotal part in telling the story of black history. 
The Congdon Street Baptist Church is one of the oldest black churches in the country. Kate Walsh spoke to its pastor and congregation about why this church and its building has been so successful for decades. Parishioners would agree that it's the people, not necessarily a building, who comprise a church. But Congdon Street Baptist Church here in Providence also plays an important role. The building itself tells a story of black history here in Rhode Island. It's a sleepy, snowy Sunday morning on College Hill in Providence. But a warmth radiating from the historic Congdon Street Baptist Church welcomes you in. We've engendered a community and culture where people know their somebody. Pastor Justin Lester explains this is the first service back in person in some time due to COVID. And even in the inclement weather, parishioners showed up. Others streamed online. It's the refuge. You feel safe, right? You're comfortable. God's word is going forth. You're seen, you're loved, and you're heard. I think that's where God gains glory. And so from that, we've seen generation, all six generations in worship from a, a couple of 90-year-olds to some newborns. Even before being assigned here as pastor, Lester knew of this church as one of the oldest black churches in the country, now over two centuries old. 200 years, mm -hmm. 202 years now? Yep, 202. The Congdon Street Baptist Church traces its history back to 1820 when freed slaves and African people in Providence listed in this original document weren't satisfied with sitting in the balcony at the predominantly white First Baptist Church down the hill, so they built their own. Originally founded as the African Union Meeting House about two blocks from here on Meeting Street, and uh, it was burned down years after um, by some individuals who just, I they, we believe, didn't agree with uh, slaves being free here in Rhode Island. But they rebuilt here at this very Congdon Street location. This is an hour and a half of knowing you're somebody, connecting with other somebodies, and leaving out of here knowing that I know there's a safe environment for that, and then hopefully I can take that to my workplace, to my home, where I can encourage somebody else to know that they're seen, they're loved. He said modernizing Jesus' word is what keeps his parish strong in number. It's the juxtaposition of technology and tradition that's obvious throughout the church. These family plaques next to QR codes to check out more online. And also these stained glass windows next to new monitors so the congregation can participate in singing traditional hymns. In Providence, I'm Kate Walsh, 12 News. Kate, thank you. Well, do you remember your first time skiing or snowboarding? For a group of Providence students of color, it was their first time just a few weeks ago. I was there with them at Yagu Valley when these students took a shot at going downhill. You start here, you get your board, when you're done at the then you strap in and, push all the way down and, and you hit the powder. But for this group, it's an experience that for some may be once in a lifetime. I've never done um, skiing before. So it's, it's kind of exciting for me. This group of Mount Pleasant High School students are skiing and snowboarding. An opportunity years in the making and one that cost them nothing. We, we don't even know who gave us the money. We needed about $1,500 to run this um, ski trip. And uh, one person came up with uh, one check and gave it to us. And uh, these kids didn't have to spend $1 out of their pocket. Look up, David, look up. When they got the news that they were one of the lucky 30 students selected. I feel, I don't know, lucky, <laughs> blessed. Feels good. Uh, it's okay, but it's hot. Yeah. And it was on an unusually warm February day where temps crept into the low 60s, these students locked in and gave it their best shot. Pizza, pizza, pizza ing, shredding, and carving their way down the slopes. For Jennifer Duque, it's the perfect example of why she came to America for a better education and opportunities. Her family is in Guatemala, and when she told her parents about this trip, I was like, guess what, mom? I just went skiing. She's like, what? So while the day came with its challenges, it's, it's been really hard, especially learning how to like walk in these boots are really heavy. The fact that these students gave it a whirl was a special treat. I'm so used to working with them with the masks on in the classroom, and it's just so nice to see them sort of like get out in the in, get out in nature and have fun, have a smile on their face. What surprised you the most today? Uh, how fearless some of them are. Yeah, I mean, I think if I were 14 and learning to ski for the first time, I would not be doing what a lot of they were doing. To the sponsor who gave us this opportunity, we say thank you. In Exeter, I'm Chelsea Jones, 12 News.
That was a fun day for everybody, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> and it was a joy for me to see them, and all thanks to someone who wanted to remain anonymous, funding that trip. And then after that aired, somebody else donated more money for another group of students to go. That's terrific. You know, some of these kids have not left their neighborhood right. or city, so to do something like this is absolutely terrific. It was. It was so good to see. Well, thank you very much for joining us this past half hour as we honor black history. Our coverage continues right now on WPRI.com. There you can see extended interviews and links on any of these stories you just saw. Plus, our 12 news special, Diverse Discussions, two years after the death of George Floyd, sparked a movement. We're talking with local community members about racial equality, affordable housing, and what has and has not changed. For Chelsea Jones, I'm Mike Montecalvo. Have a good night.